lot of people and trying to pick apart like why is that happened um, is is often a tough challenge and that's something that uh, kind of Roland um, and people have been working on trying to make so these is... results um, uh, kind of, kind of um, something you can kind of pick apart understand where it's come from and play with so uh, with that over to, to you Roland Okay, thank you. Uh, it's great to be here. I'm, uh, my name's Roly. I'm a researcher at the Institute of Computing for Climate Science. So this is joint work with Joe Bond, who's a PhD student at Bristol, uh, Christina David, who's a, a senior lecturer at Bristol, and Min Nagoyan, who's a former student of mine, who's now a postdoc also at Bristol. Yeah. Is that facing up? I assume that's up. Uh, Okay, how's that? Do you wanna? Okay. Okay. Sure. The <laughs> okay, so I'm going to present a programming language called Fluid. Uh, this is very much work in progress, so not everything I'm going to talk about today is is fully worked out. But I hope it will be interesting. So we understand and make decisions about the world around us using data, data that's been curated by scientists, journalists, and and. Uh, into charts, figures, and words. So here are some extracts from an IPCC report from 2021. We have some charts, but it, it's not entirely obvious what we're looking at, uh, even with the legends to help. There might be some accompanying text, but it's not clear what the science that's being specifically referred to is. There are numbers in these texts, in this text, where do, where do they come from? So whether we're a scientist reviewing the work of others, a journalist writing about science or a teacher explaining something to a student or just a regular person trying to make sense of what we see on the news, we end up having to take things on trust. So arguably, this is a reasonable problem for traditional print media. But with digital media, there should be, should be some prospects for doing things better. So how can the PL help with this? So what might we be able to do? So suppose we have this chart, which according to the caption is plotting uh, clean energy efficiency or perhaps clean capacity factor, depending on which part of the chart you look at, against uh, the proportion of energy capacity attributed, attributable to renewables. So already that's quite a complicated sounding thing. And indeed, there are lots of questions we might have in order to understand what we're actually looking at here. So what do these points represent? Uh, what are the ratios that are being plotted? What kinds of energy are being considered? What counts as renewable and so forth? So some libraries provide kind of tool tips like this. So these give us more clarity on the output, the data that's being visualized, but they don't say anything about the relationship to the input. Um, and of course, we can, you know, if we have open source and open data, we might be able to make some headway at that kind of uh, comprehension challenge by looking at that, but that's unlikely to be an easy task. So um, I'm going to just give you a, a quick demo now of uh, Fluid, which is a programming language where uh, the, the goal is to make it possible to answer these sorts of questions by interacting directly with the, art, the chart itself. So, for example, if I can get a mouse cursor. Into the right window. Maybe mirroring would have been a better idea. So if I select this point here, and you'll have to forgive the performance because it's quite slow at the moment, um, then we get a view of the data that was needed in order to compute that point. So in this case, we can see that, for example, we're looking at the, let me make it slightly smaller. We can see that we're looking at the uh, France data for 2018. We can see that we're using the capacity and the output data. And that might give us some kind of sense of what's going on. Now, this isn't uh, you know, enough information to, to give us a full picture of what we're looking at. And indeed, if we select an additional point here, we'll actually see that it becomes less informative because we'll now have data associated with uh, Japan, and then it's less clear what's being attributed to what, and so on. But the point is that this gives us, at, at least it's a useful starting point. It tells us where to look in the data sets for the relevant data, perhaps what, what to look for in the code, and so on. Um, but so, so, so this is the kind of, uh, kind of interactive chart that you can produce using Fluid. Uh, the, the work in progress that I want to talk about today, or focus on today, is a if you like, if we reverse this interaction. So instead of starting with the output, we start with the input. So we might be interested in a particular piece of data and wonder how, which parts of the output does it contribute to and, and what other inputs are going to be relevant for understanding that particular uh, input. So at the moment, we can only make that selection once we've already pulled in 
some data by selecting some of the outputs, so that's just a limitation of the current user interface. But suppose I select this coal capacity of Japan here, then what will si the system will respond by highlighting the part of the output that was consuming this data, and then giving us a view in gray of all the other data that was needed to compute that output. So you, you might notice that the output is no longer being consumed here. And that's because the coal capacity of Japan is actually only relevant to computing the X coordinate at this point. So that's a rather subtle point. Um, and you know, I, in, ideally, we'd like to be able to kind of separate out those two different dimensions of the output and make it possible to uh, sort of explore them interactively, independently, sorry. And I'll, I'll come back to that later in the talk. But for now, uh, let me just sort of expand on that slightly by showing you what happens if we, if we select the capacity for Japan in the same year, the renewables, uh, the hydro capacity. So what we'll see is that the output now does become relevant. And that's because the capacity is actually needed to compute the Y coordinate of that point. So I guess what this highlights, uh, sort of not very well because the user interface doesn't really reflect it yet, but the fact that there are two independent dimensions of data being visualized by each point, each induces a different demand on the input, and that in turn induces different relations of relevance between various parts of the input. Okay, so let me unpack a little bit how that works. So uh, the basic idea is we want to be able to traverse dependency information in two directions. So we start with an initial selection, the bit I showed you in green. We can ask using this triangle operator what outputs are demanding that data. And that gives us what we call the mediating output which in this case was just the x-coordinate at this point. And then we can traverse the same information in the other direction and say, okay, what inputs do we now need in order to compute the x-coordinate at that point? And those are then the bits that are highlighted in gray, which we call the secondary selection. Um, and that's, that, that's what we saw. Okay, and this relationship isn't idempotent. So uh, in other words, there may be, if I'm an input, I may be related via one output to some other outputs, um, and that other in, those other inputs may in turn be related to other inputs through other outputs, and so on. Okay, so that's the basic idea. This chart was implemented in Fluid, which is an untyped uh, functional language with a fairly standard set of features. What distinguishes it from a traditional language is that programs evaluate not only to a result, but also to uh, a dynamic dependence graph, capturing dependencies between inputs and outputs and intermediate values. And then we use this graph to uh, implement these demands and demanded by operators that I showed on the previous page. And we can then expose this metadata through a JS, uh, a D3 front end that kind of allows you to explore these relationships. So we call this data transparency or extensional transparency. Once this uh, current piece of work is complete, we plan to look at more intentional forms of transparency as well. So let me say something about the formal setting here, which is actually very simple. So suppose X and Y are sets of atomic data elements, say inputs and outputs, and R is a relation between them, then the two di directions of navigation that we've been talking about uh, correspond to the image and pre-image functions for R between subsets of X and Y. So I can pick out a subset of the uh, inputs and ask what outputs are related and, and go in the other direction as well. And these two functions are conjugate, which just captures this notion of reciprocality at the level of sets rather than individual elements. And conjugates are related to adjoints. Uh, F and G are conjugate whenever the F and the dual of G are adjoint. So for us, R is just going to be reachability in this dependency graph that I mentioned for a program. And we denote uh, these two functions with these uh, up and down triangle operators. And then we can compose these two things together to compute related inputs. Uh, so this, this essentially composes these image functions for R and its inverse, which is, just gives you the image function for the endo relation you get by composing R with its, with its converse. So if you like, it answers the question, uh, what other things are the things that are related to me related to? And uh, linguists have a... a, a a, a nice handy term for that, cognacy. So two things are cognate if they have common ancestry, and that's essentially what this related inputs uh, relation is giving us. And we can do the same for related outputs. I'll come to that in a sec. And these are just slightly more useful versions of these operators that 
also include the mediating data that explain why two inputs or two outputs are related. Okay, so this related inputs thing I've been talking about is, is actually dual to something called data, uh, brushing and linking in data visualization. And we explored this in our Popple paper uh, in 2022. So if you're not familiar with um, brushing and linking, I'll just show you what that looks like. So if we have two charts here, which are views of uh, the same underlying data, then if we select a bar in the left chart, say, um, we can see the data that's being demanded by that bar. But we also see some points highlighted on the right. And that's because those points on the right are, are cognate with the bar in the sense of having a common ancestry in the dependency graph. And we could do the same thing and pick a point over here. Um, just deselect that. And explore the relationship in the other direction. OK, so that's brushing and linking. But in that paper, uh, this, we have this formal setup that uh, didn't quite generalize to what we want to do with related inputs. So we have two, two views of the same data, F and G. We had dependency analyses, similar to what I showed you earlier, for each of those views. And then just by swapping one of those dependency analyses by its conjugate, we were able to compute this relationship between uh, the two outputs. But it doesn't lend itself to composition in the other direction because C and B aren't, com aren't composable. So uh, obviously, if you're a functional programmer, the more general form of this is, is the product view of F and G. And so we're, we're ne we now just have a single dependency operator. So I've omitted the subscript. And we can compose this operator with its own conjugate to obtain an endomorphism on C times uh, on B times C. And then we can just project away the parts of the output we don't care about, perhaps the left chart or the right chart. Uh, and that essentially, using projection functions that also have conjugates, and, and that recovers the prior work, uh, but in a way that's then amenable to related inputs. So that's basically the relationship uh, to, the, to the prior work. And then I'll, finally, I'll just mention that this basic idea of projection that can be run in both directions because it has a conjugate turns out to be a really, really useful idea. So if lots of outputs depend on the same input, then we can obtain a more fine-grained query by projecting away the problematic input. In other words, restricting the mediating data to some subset. So just for the final demo, I'll show you what that looks like. So this is a matrix convolution example that I would have shown some of you before. Uh, if I, so this is the output of the convolution. The, the two inputs are shown in the left, the input image and the filter. If I select an element of the output, then we can see the inputs that are being demanded in order to compute this output. But we also have this uh, gray selection, which is showing us the related outputs. And these outputs are related because they are cognate with this selected element. So they are demanding overlapping data, essentially. So this isn't very informative if we look at this example, because all of the output elements are demanding the filter. But what we can do is just pretend that the filter doesn't exist, essentially. So then we can select an element of the output, and then we see something that's more intuitive and informative. And so, uh, yeah, th this is something that we want to push on, um, not just for related outputs, but also for related inputs. So just to quickly say what, what, what we could do there. Um, so in, example, in the example like the scatterplot one I showed you earlier, we could separate out the two dimensions of a particular point by just projecting one away, and then look at the cognacy relation that's induced just by the data relevant to the remaining coordinate. So we can imagine extending this to a whole layer of a visualization. So if we think about the IPCC of report earlier, we could, for example, restrict interest to just the uh, confidence in the human contribution layer of the visualization. So these are the dots that appear in the hex. And then by doing so, we can investigate related inputs in a narrower context. It's going to allow us to answer questions like, for a given input, what other inputs were relevant specifically to obtaining that confidence rating? Okay, so I'm going to stop there. Uh, this is something we're still working on, and apologies that this is a bit work in progress. These are the, some of the things we'd like to add to the language. Um, and I'm especially interested in, in building out some substantive examples, perhaps using this markdown quasi quotation feature. Um, and the idea would be to build some in depth articles explaining some kind of climate adjacent science uh, with, with these sorts of transparent charts and figures. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Um, Patrick.
Very nice stuff. Um, I, I want a question. So if, if you just take a simple numbers, you, you, you're showing a, a number of data points, but instead of uh, showing their absolute values, you show their relative values between 0 and 100%. I guess that would mean that at every point mm -hmm. is sort of, I mean, if you select any point, everything Yeah, yeah, I mean, it. I guess th there's lots of sort of patterns in data science where you're doing some kind of aggregative, aggregative thing or some kind of cumulative thing and where you potentially do, are you talking about that kind of thing where you may get lots of dependencies? Yeah, I mean, if, if, you, if, you, if you're plotting a number of values, 10 values, and but you're plotting not their value, but their percentage, the, right. then it, they're all affected by each other, mm -hmm. sort of. Yeah, like a stack bar chart or something, yeah. I guess, might have something like that. Yeah, I think that's that's a good point. And this thing that I've been talking about towards the end of the talk, the idea of kind of projecting away outputs and inputs that aren't relevant and, and using that to obtain a more focused query, I think that, that's what we're hoping is going to allow us to sort of address that sort of problem. Yeah, because I, I was trying to think about those diagrams you had, because usually the diagram does actually depend on all of the values because mm -hmm. you've chosen the maximum of the axis and yeah. so on. So it means that you have an implicit hiding of some dependencies. So I'm a bit curious what this... Yeah, I mean, if I, in, a, in a very earlier yeah. version of this, um, I, we kind of went as far as implementing old kind of graphics library in this approach. And, and then you, things like the positioning of the tick marks start to depend on the data because you have heuristics about how you're going to place ticks depending on the distribution of the data. So I think that doesn't mean that it's not worth using this sort of approach in that setting, I think it just means we do need to think about how we can sort of tease apart these different parts of the dependency structure and say, this isn't of interest now, this might be interest of interest to some other kind of question you might ask, if that makes sense. Cool. Um, I'm doing, go around this way. A really, really nice talk. Um, so there's been a lot of really interesting research pointing out that developers, and I imagine also data scientists and, and journalists and so on, um, ask kind of why questions mm -hmm. uh, um, about the outputs of programs. Um, and, and that is also kind of how you were framing this, like why is the x, act, uh, x value of this point this value? So I wonder um, if you've thought about this being more explicitly a sort of a, a why query based interface as opposed to just a, a click and see Kind of yeah, relevant interface. that's a very good point. I mean, I guess that's what I was getting at with the intentional or more intentional kinds of explanations. So, uh -huh. you know, at a minimum, you can sort of take this fine grained view where you say, I've got this big output. Can I kind of ask questions about how parts of the output relate to parts of the input? But you can imagine extending that with, can I derive some kind of explanation of how that output part was computed just using the parts of the computation that were relevant to it? Uh -huh. I think that would start to yeah. do that kind of thing. And one more quick question. I'm going to go here just because. Thanks for the awesome talk. Um, given that the most one of the most common vehicles of research is like PDFs, and um, most people see graphs on PDFs. Um, I mean, I would love to be able to do this on every later generated PDF I, I, I made, but I, that's not possible, I suppose. Um, what? How do you see researchers using this kind of interactive graphs in, um, to, in, when they display their data? Stop using PDFs, I guess. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, it feels like PDF is a kind of horrible, skeuomorphic anachronism that basically just tries to look like a sheet of paper. And I, I think we, we definitely can do better. I mean, I guess this would give motivation, right? Because I guess one of the factors is PDF is good enough until... Yeah. Until we yeah. can do this. Uh, yeah, I suppose to have a reason to move beyond PDFs is also nice. So maybe it's we can start sort of making it more compelling that there is an alternative to a sort of static bitmap. Cool. Well, thank you very much. Thank you. Please thank the speaker.